this right here is the Canon XL1. It's more than 25 years old, but I still think it's one of the coolest cameras ever made. I think it's easy to take things for granted when it comes to cameras these days. Even a mid-level phone from several years ago is capable of producing better picture quality than the professional broadcast cameras that came before it. But getting great image quality wasn't always as simple, accessible, or affordable as it is now. In fact, that is a super, super recent thing. For most of the time that video and film have existed, there have been two classes of users. Professionals, usually studios and production companies who can afford equipment to create the highest quality possible, and everybody else where no matter how much time you spent on lighting and framing, no one was going to be fooled into thinking your eight millimeter handy cam was a Hollywood cam. Of course, there were a few cameras that were outliers, but they were usually limited in some pretty critical ways like having a built-in lens or poor low light performance. The Canon XL1 was a broadcast quality video camera with interchangeable lenses that, while still expensive, allowed mere mortals to own a camera capable of creating truly professional results. For me, the XL1 was my dream camera when it was released, but I was still a teenager at the time. So even with that attainable, affordable $4,000 MSRP, it was still so far beyond anything I ever thought I could ever possibly afford. That is, until now. Now to truly appreciate the XL1, we need to give it a little bit of context because you can't spell context without X. Back in 1998, video cameras were pretty different. At that time, most people were using eight millimeter and VHS camcorders, and there were three chip cameras that had higher quality at the time, but they were typically for broadcast purposes and not really affordable for most people. And basically what that chip thing means is that most cameras, most camcorders have one chip that handles all three of the primary colors, red, green, and blue. Those three colors go into that chip. It converts them and combines them to create an image. A three chip camera has, believe it or not, three chips, one for each color, red, green, and blue, which basically means that each of those primary colors has the image processing power of an entire single chip camcorder behind it. So then when those three chips combine their powers like some sort of image sensor Avengers, the result is a much higher quality image and much better low light performance. And that's usually what you would see on broadcast television in the late 90s, early 2000s. So with that in mind, that means that no matter what you did, your single chip camcorder, no matter how much effort you put into making things look as good as possible, there was a very real limit on the level of image quality you could achieve. And while broadcast cameras like this were costing somewhere between 20, 30, $40,000, the XL1 came out for $4,000, which is a three chip camera, and it has an XL lens mount, which turned out to be an extra large advantage because that means you could change out the lenses on this three chip camera. So just like DSLRs would do years later when they started implementing video features, if I can get this lens on here, the XL1 brought unheard of quality to normal people or average, I guess no videographers are really normal, but to the average videographer. And that was all a full decade before the first DSLRs would start implementing video features. But on top of all of this, Canon knew that developing a new lens mount was a slow and expensive process, and it didn't really make a lot of sense to develop a whole lineup of lenses for a very niche mount, the XL mount, that they weren't even sure whether or not it was going to be successful. The XL1 did come standard with a 5.5 to 88 millimeter lens that had image stabilization and power zoom. So just real quick, let's take a minute to appreciate how awesome this lens is that comes with this camera. This camera does not have a very big sensor at all. So that means, I don't know what the full frame equivalent of this would be. 5.5 to 88 millimeters is a pretty good zoom length, but then to also have image stabilization, very usable image stabilization built in, autofocus built in, and a built in ND filter. This is pretty much the only lens you would need for most purposes, but you did have other options, including a wide angle lens and a fully manual lens, and since beyond those lenses, there really never was much natively released for the XL lens mount, Canon did release an EF to XL adapter. So this very not sleek looking thing requires its own battery. And then you can attach one side to the camera and another side to any of Canon's EF lenses, which was still at that time a massive lineup like it is today. And then you could use any of those existing lenses with the XL1. And since there is a battery in here, when I turn on the camera, 
you'll see this lights up. You can still maintain some of the autofocus and image stabilization and aperture control over your lens. It kind of varies depending on the lens that you're using, but that means you don't even have to do fully manual control on these lenses. You could still have some auto controls as well. And then you had an absolutely absurd amount of options when it comes to lenses, not only zoom lenses like this 24 to 105, but also prime lenses. And so now the image quality that you're able to get, you're able to get that super shallow depth of field. You're able to get really, cool bits of focus. Look how zoomed in I am on this monitor right here with this Canon EF lens. Even though this is not HD footage, this is still pretty impressive footage for a camcorder from the 90s. And this also meant that in a world with camcorders that had just it was almost impossible to get a shallow depth of field. Not only were you able to use these high quality lenses with your XL1, but for almost the first time ever, you were now able to use a prime lens with a camcorder. So now here I am on a camcorder from 1998, filming with an aperture of f1.4, getting super clear subjects, nice blurry backgrounds. This is the kind of thing that just never would have been possible ever before. But all of that doesn't even touch on one of the best parts, if not the best part of this camera, which is the form factor. And simply put, I think the form factor is still second to none. This design is clearly based on traditional ENG cameras, which has been around for a very long time. And that means that practicality is at the forefront. An ENG or electronic news gathering camera is typically what you would see on the shoulder of a camera person from a TV news station, but it might be news to you that they were used for a lot more than just news. ENG cameras, especially before DSLR and mirrorless video were hugely popular for working videographers. And a really cool thing is that ENG cameras, at least externally, haven't really changed much since the 80s or 90s, not unlike myself. Even though it seems very big and clunky, this is kind of a perfect design for what it needs to do. So the only real room for improvement have been the internals where you can upgrade the image quality and the type of media that you're recording to. But why on earth would I say that something big and clunky like this is a perfect design? Everything on an ENG camera is just super ergonomic. You probably notice all the buttons and switches and levers and physical things. There's very few touch screens that you have to go into. You can just feel where everything is and then push a big, chunky clicky button that makes a thing happen. And when you're in a situation where things need to work reliably and consistently, and you're in a situation where stuff changes very, very quickly, being able to do that all very physically and very tactilely on a well-balanced camera that also then makes it very easy to get super steady footage is a hugely important thing when it comes to the design of that camera. So what the XL1 did was it took this design and it just made it a little bit more compact and a little bit more user-friendly. ENG cameras are also usually very repairable and sometimes even upgradable. So while video cameras and camcorders at the time that the XL1 was released were not typically repairable or upgradable, the XL1 was quite modular because in addition to being able to change out the lens, you could also change out and replace the microphone and the viewfinder, which leaves just this as the core camera body, making it very modular and upgradable and even a bit repairable. There's also even an XLR shoulder mount that you can attach to the back of the camera, which would then give you two full-size XLR inputs and some more mounting options to even potentially run the camera off of a V-mount battery, just like a big ENG camera. So the idea that a person, a regular person, could actually own a camera capable of being used for actual broadcast was just mind-blowing. I was only 13 years old in 1998, and that $4,000 price tag, while it seemed well, it was more money than I had ever seen in one place at that point in my life. It did kind of seem like something that if I worked really hard and saved for a few years, I might be able to actually get an XL1 broadcast quality camcorder of my own. And that's something that was never even on the horizon of the realm of possibility before. And to take that even further, as part of the marketing for the XL1's launch, Canon even used it to make a commercial for one of their other consumer camcorders as a proof of concept that it was truly good enough for real broadcast and commercial use. The image is completely stable, and the camera is so lightweight that I'm able to hand hold it myself. I can put the camera above my head, all the way down at my feet. I think the picture quality of the XL1 in comparison to other industrial grade video cameras is far superior. So after seeing that, at that point, I don't think I'd ever wanted anything more in my life than a Canon XL1. I even had a printed picture of it 
pinned to my wall all throughout middle school and high school. So while other people had like celebrities and supermodels on their walls, I had the Canon XL1. Before we look a little more at the performance of the XL1, I think it's important to set some expectations, some XL spectations you might say. First, let's separate the design and features from the actual image quality because I think it might be a mistake to dismiss the XL1 based on the fact that its image quality isn't on par with newer cameras. But it is important to remember that that image quality was amazing at the time of its release. So even though you could still use the XL1 in current projects for like a fun retro vibe and effect, the image quality does objectively pale in comparison to pretty much any modern camera at any price point. I really wanted to put this claim to the test, so I rigged up a way to shoot side-by-side -side footage with the XL1 and different smartphones, ranging from current to, I guess what would be called vintage at this point, which makes me kind of sad. It's no surprise that the iPhone 14 Pro looks much better than the XL1. It's a phone with a really impressive camera, but going back a few years further, the iPhone XR's 4K footage still looks really good, and the stabilization makes a really big difference too, so the whole thing definitely outperforms the XL1. So this made me curious, and I wanted to see when phone camera image quality began to surpass cameras like the XL1. Going back almost a decade to the iPhone 6, which tops out at 1080 high definition video, I think the footage is still really impressive overall from the phone, especially the dynamic range in the sky and the clouds in this scene. So now it's time to really dig into some old boxes in the closet and find my iPhone 4 from 2010. The iPhone 4 could shoot video at 720p, which while not full HD, still does look a lot better than I expected it to compared to the XL1. But I think this is also where the lack of stabilization really starts to become more noticeable, keeping in mind the XL1 has a heavier body that helps keep things stable along with stabilization built right into the lens. My oldest smartphone is the iPhone 3GS from 2009, which was eight years after my XL1S was released. The 3GS was the first iPhone capable of recording video and could film up to a whopping 480p, which as it turns out is just about the same resolution as the XL1. And this is where I thought things got the most interesting because the image quality between the Canon XL1 and the iPhone 3GS is pretty darn similar. If anything, this is where the XL1 starts to have an edge because even though the resolution is almost the same between them, the XL1 does have that awesome lens and a much bigger image sensor. But just think about that. It only took a few years for something that fits in your pocket to rival the image quality of the XL1, which was a professional broadcast camera. Of course, keeping in mind that no phone has the manual controls or ergonomics of a dedicated camera, even if the image quality is the same or better. But again, that form factor, which leads into the fun factor, are both off the charts, which is a very scientific measurement of form and function. And that all goes back to that core ENG camera design that we just talked about. So let's take a quick look at everything the XL1 has to offer in terms of its design. On what we can call the main side, you have a lot of controls for like your exposure, your lens release, iris select, and these are all right where your hand is going to be when the camera is on your shoulder. There's a big physical control wheel that will turn the camera on off and change between modes. And then you have a little LCD that tells you what mode you're in and gives you some tape counter information and all that. You have a lot more physical buttons right here to access menus and different settings. And something I really, really like is that these buttons here, these dials for your audio gain and some of the other controls like white balance and exposure, they push out and then you can turn them and then push them in to lock them. So once you have them set, they're kind of locked in and they don't take up much more space, but it is also supremely satisfying to push them in and lock them and unlock them. It is just really fun. Now, just like we saw on the big ENG camera, there was this panel I could flip down here to give me a whole host of audio controls. On the XL1, we've got pretty much the same thing. There's this little panel back here that opens up and then gives you some more audio controls. Some can be accessed through this panel and some can be only accessed once this is open. We've got an exposure dial right here. And then on the top of the camera, we have a lot more controls because it is meant to be also held this way. So it can be used on your shoulder, but it can also be held here. And then the viewfinder, of course, goes right into your eye, which is totally adjustable right here. The viewfinder also, since there isn't an LCD display, on an ENG camera like this, when there wasn't an LCD flip out display, what you can do is flip up the viewfinder and then you actually just look at the little viewfinder screen. So if you need to be far away, 
that's kind of how you do that. The XL1 doesn't have that option, but it does have this near far switch. So near far, wherever you are, you can see into the viewfinder really easily. If you put that to near, then that means it's going to magnify it to be up close to your eye. And if you push it to far, it physically moves a little screen further away. So that way you can look into the viewfinder from a distance and kind of use it like an LCD screen. It is still very tiny, but it's at least a way to use the camera without having to have your eye up against the viewfinder. But again, the camera is really designed in a really nice way to be used handheld like this from the top handle here. You have zoom controls, you have a start stop record button, you also even have a photo button if you wanna to try to take photos, although do not use the X-L1 as a photo camera, just, just don't. And then I always love it when cameras have things like this little trap door that opens up and then you've got all of your playback controls and including some stuff for audio dubs and AV inserts. So if you wanna do some in-camera editing, which is something that was a lot easier to do with tape cameras than it is with cameras that record to a memory card, you could do some of that right here in the camera. And then when you take the tape out of the camera, you already have something that's a little bit a little bit edited and put together. And on the very back, you have a headphone input and then also a volume control for your headphone output. So it really is designed with a lot of those more professional features in mind that make the camera super easy to operate and kind of cover all your bases, both in terms of video and audio production. You do have your side handle here, which has the zoom rocker switch. And this feels every bit as good as the zoom rocker switch on this ENG camera. These rocker switches provide a really tactile experience when it comes to zoom controls because the harder that you press it, the faster the camera will zoom and the less pressure you put on it, the slower it will zoom. And the XL1s works the exact same way and almost feels exactly the same. I would say it's like 95% there. There's also a little photo button here if you want to. And then of course you have your record button, your big red record button right there. The camera has some pretty interesting IO options. On the back, you have your traditional RCA jacks. So your red, yellow, and white jacks that let you output your audio. There's also S-Video, which is slightly higher quality video than just using the yellow RCA jack. But the modernness of the camera comes on the side over here where I can take down this little cover. And now we have a FireWire port along with options to connect a remote control and even, I guess, a flash or something. So there's a little more advanced IO options on the side out here. That FireWire one, being one of the biggest features and the biggest updates. And then of course you do have your tape eject button right here. So it pops open. And then you have your mini DV tape. Now during that little tour, you might've noticed that the logo here on my camera says that it is actually the XL1S, which was an updated version released in 2001. Now we will talk about different versions of the XL1 in the next section, but the XL1S did have slightly better image quality than the original. Although to be fair with modern eyes that are used to modernized cameras, I don't think anyone's really gonna know the difference between the XL1 and the XL1S in terms of footage these days, but there was a bit of a difference. Either way, both of them look absolutely incredible for the time, for the time that they're from. Now, because this camera records to a tape, working with the footage, the workflow is a little bit funky. There is the FireWire port, which was extremely advanced for the time because newer computers in 1998 and the early 2000s started having FireWire ports. You could get a blue translucent iMac DV and import your footage directly into iMovie 1.0. But unfortunately with newer computers using FireWire can be a little tricky. So what I do instead is I just use the Elgato video capture, which is an easier way to essentially make a camera a USB source and then record the footage to your computer. But again, because this does record to tape, there is a one-to-one -one ratio between footage and time it takes to import that footage. So if you have 40 minutes of video, it's going to take, you guessed it, 40 minutes to import that video to your computer. So just keep that in mind. Next time you feel a little bit frustrated that your SD card is taking like six minutes to import 70 gigabytes of footage, just remember, Real-time importing was a thing that was a really not fun time for a long time. But with all this in mind, you can use the XL1 in some pretty fun and creative ways with modern workflows. Obviously you can import the footage to your computer relatively easily, but you can also use relatively inexpensive things like this HDMI converter, which will then take these RCA analog outputs and convert them into an HDMI source that you can run into a monitor, into a digital recorder so you could totally bypass the tape recording and just record directly to a digital recorder. Or you could even run the camera through the HDMI converter and then run that HDMI into a capture card and then record directly to your computer. 
or even use the XL1 or any old analog camcorder as a source for live streaming, which is incredibly fun. The autofocus on here is surprisingly capable, especially for something like a one person talking head live stream. And so I've done that a few times and it is really, really fun. And it's a cool way to sort of give new life to these older cameras. And here's an example of me streaming totally for real with the XL1, just running into Ecamm Live through the Elgato Cam Link and the HDMI converter, and then I can run my audio through the Rodecaster or whatever I want, or even from the XL1. But the important thing to take away from all this is that even though the image quality of the XL1 is seriously dated, the design and features are still absolutely awesome, and in many ways, far better than what's available on modern cameras. And that's something that I think has really helped to build a lasting legacy for the XL1. Maybe that L stands for legacy. To better understand the legacy of the XL1, we need to go further back in time and look at what came before it. So let's drop the X and go all the way back to the Canon L1, which was released seven years earlier in 1991. I have a separate video entirely all about this super strange and super interesting camera, but basically this was the first attempt by any company at making a camcorder that had interchangeable lenses. The L1 used Canon's VL mount, which was even more niche and limited than the XL mount would be. But just like they would do with the XL1 later on, Canon did release an adapter that let you then use any EF lens with a VL lens mount, which also shows you how long EF lenses have been around for, because again, this was 1991. So it works exactly the same as the adapter with the XL1. You pop that on there, and then you can take any EF lens. And now you do have an eight millimeter camcorder with interchangeable lenses, which could include prime lenses at a super shallow depth of field. So this was, despite how insane it looks and a little bit ridiculous it is, this is a pretty groundbreaking development in the world of camcorders and home slash personal video. And this camera had an MSRP of about $3,000 when it was released. But even in its standard form, the design of the Canon L1 is completely bizarre. It's literally like they melted an SLR photo camera and a camcorder together into one thing. It's honestly one of the best slash worst examples of design by committee that I've ever seen. But as much as the L1 was an absurd and experimental proof of concept, it did prove that there was interest in interchangeable lens camcorders that weren't outrageously expensive. And Canon would take a lot of cues from the L1 and then develop those into what would later on become the XL1. And unlike the L1, the XL1 was a huge success. It would remain incredibly popular all the way through the mid 2000s when a lot of productions and projects then started switching from standard definition to high definition. And like I said earlier, my specific camera is actually the XL1S, which was released in 2001, but this was not the only update to the XL1 lineup. Canon released the XL2 in 2004, which had significantly improved image quality. And even though it was still a standard definition camcorder, the XL2 did have some pretty cool options for things like true widescreen and lots of frame rate options, including true 24 frames per second. And even though the XL2 was a better camera overall than the previous XL1 models, it never really took off to the same degree because just a year later in 2005, Canon released the XL1H, which was the first high definition version of the XL1. And even though it recorded a tape, it was an HD camera, but it was 1080i interlaced. HD video, so it wasn't the highest high definition that there ever was, but it was a high definition camera. And once cameras like that came out and workflows started switching over from standard definition to high definition, it didn't really make sense for a lot of people or production companies to keep investing in standard definition cameras. And then just a couple of years later in 2008, Canon would release the 5D Mark II, which was really the first DSLR. It wasn't the first DSLR that shot video, but it was the first one that made DSLR video a big thing because now high definition, full frame quality video with a really amazing lens lineup was really accessible to pretty much everyone. It was less expensive than the XL1 was, even though it was not as video centric as something like this was because the video functionality was really added to the 5D Mark II as an afterthought. But that kind of kicked off that DSLR video revolution. And then every camera after that kept growing and iterating. And now we have, you know, 4K mirrorless cameras, 8K mirrorless cameras that while they still look like SLR photo cameras or DSLRs, they are video first and video centric cameras. But 
that's also something is sort of lost in that because in terms of video functionality, this is infinitely more practical than a design like this. And Canon knows that because the XL1's DNA, I think very clearly lives on in their current lineup. While there's nothing exactly like it and no direct descendants of the XL1, you can definitely see elements of the design in Canon Cinema Series cameras like the C300 and C500, and Canon's semi-pro lineup of camcorders, the XA series, carries on the X designation, even though those camcorders don't offer interchangeable lenses. So while the XL1 does remain a camcorder of the past, you can see that its exceptional legacy definitely still exists in cameras today. Finally getting my own XL1 after all these years has honestly been kind of an amazing experience. It's such a joy to use this camera and it's so much fun, even if the footage never actually goes anywhere and no one else but me ever even sees it. And even though the image quality isn't something I can regularly use in my current projects, I do feel like the camera does live up to all of the hype from when it was released back in 1998. If I were back then, this would meet every meet or exceed every expectation I have for it. And like I said earlier, the form factor really is second to none. I cannot tell you how much I would love a modern version of the X01 that shoots 4K video to an SD card or a compact flash card and just has a little flip out screen, maybe instead of the viewfinder or in addition to the viewfinder or just something you can add on as an accessory. I think that, I don't know, an XL3 or an XL4K would really catch on and become an insanely popular camera in today's world because it is overall still excellent. And speaking of things that are excellent, thank you to everyone who helps support my channel through Patreon and YouTube channel memberships. It's largely because of you that I was finally able to get this dream camera after all of these years. And if you like old interesting cameras as much as I do, check out my video on the bizarre Canon L1 and the wacky history behind it. <laughs>